You know, lately I've been doing a lot of 1-6 scale brownings. And as fun as cool as those are, I think it's time maybe I should mix things up a little bit. So let's get these two out of here for the time being. Um, side, and let's see what else I got that's similar in 1-6 scale. All right, something not a browning, not a browning. Uh, no, you, well, you are a browning, so we'll save you for later. Uh, you're not a browning, but you're an FN, and that's basically browning adjacent. And, ooh, perfect. That'll work. Hey everyone, this is John from EastCoastArmory.com and I'm here today with a model showcase video for this 1-6 scale Soviet SG-43 Gorgonov. The model that we have here is built for my own personal collection and is not for sale and or purchase. However, like I often mention in these videos, I frequently take on commission build projects from models ranging between 135th scale and 1-6 scale. For availability and pricing information, that information would be best by contacting me through the email address listed below, which is info at eastcoastarmory.com. This model is built predominantly out of the box. However, during the construction, I went ahead and added a few extra details to the model, bringing it up to the condition that we have here. In this video, not only we're going to go over all these modifications as well as the kit's features, but we're going to give the model a thorough in-box review. So stay tuned because there's going to be a bit of content coming right at you. To kick this video off, let's go ahead and take a quick walk around this model. And this model here is the Soviet SG-43 Gorgonov. The Gorgonov was a medium MG that was designed by the Soviet Union in the early phases of World War II. They then adopted the unit in 1943 and used it throughout the duration of that period. I can go a little bit more into the depth and history of the design of this unit. However, that's really best left up for Ian at Forgotten Weapons. He actually did an entire video on this subject matter, and I recommend checking that video out because it is going to be far more thorough than what I can possibly state in this video. However, in a nutshell, the Soviet MG at the time was the 1910 Maxim, and this weapon was something that was really starting to show its age by this portion of time. So the Russians decided to come up with a simpler, lighter version of a medium MG that's chambered in the same ammo and also utilize the exact same belt in order to streamline the logistics and also to keep parts commonality as trying to tool up a brand new cartridge and feeding the vice at this time was really prohibitive. The SG-43 was going to use a very different operating system compared to the Maxim. The Maxim, of course, is a water-cooled MG and utilizes a short recoil system. The SG, on the other hand, was going to use a more modern gas-operated system and was going to be fully air-cooled. Because of the air-cooled nature, this severely cut the weight down and also the complexity down of the system. Both the Maxim and the SG were chambered in the same round as I touched upon before, and that round is the Soviet 762 by 54 rimmed. This is actually the oldest surfing military cartridge on the planet and still in use today, but back during the World War II time frame, it was also used by the Soviet rifles of the period, of course being the Mosin Nagants. Probably the most interesting aspect of the SG-43 is with its mount. Unlike the Western powers where their mounts are generally a tripod type system, the Russians like to mount their medium and heavy MGs on a little handcart and this allows you to wheel this thing around and it gives some extra mobility to what is generally a static piece. The little handcart has a built-in shield to protect the operator from incoming rounds and shrapnel, but also one of the coolest aspects of the mount is that it can serve as a ground roll, but it also has the ability to be used for anti-air. In order to do this, you just pivot the entire thing upward, the shield embeds itself into the dirt, and then you just mount the MG on the tail section, which has a little receptacle to allow the unit to be fitted in place. With the unit in this stand-up format, this allows you to operate this unit in a high angle roll, which is great for engaging enemy aircraft. The SG-43 served the Soviet military very well during World War II and also saw continued production and adoption after World War II with many of the comm bloc countries. A large number of these units were produced and a large number of derivatives were produced as well. There are units that are not just for ground rolls but are also used for a vehicle mount. And in fact, for the longest time, this was basically the coax MG used on a large number of Soviet-era tanks. 
But of course, that's a story for another day. Before we go any further with the video, let's go ahead and take a step back to when this model was first started in order to get a good idea on what the base starter kit supplies you with. And here's the model at the start of the build. For the base starter kit, I'll be utilizing this 1-6 scale SG-43 plastic model kit. This kit here was something that actually caught me off guard and I accidentally stumbled into it when just perusing online on the internet. I was online, I had an idea to look for an SG-43 parts kit for a different type of hobby that I'm into. And whilst, you know, navigating the internet looking for that, I stumbled into this particular kit that we have here. And like I said before, it kind of took me off guard because I wasn't aware that this was even a kit that was on the market. However, once I saw it, this was something that I instantly realized how cool it is to add to my collection. One thing that I found interesting about the kit, besides the subject matter itself, which is awesome, and I'll touch upon that in a moment, but is I'm not really sure the background of the kit that we have here. I know who produces the kit, however, the branding on the box is a bit unique. You see, if I go into the corner over here, you'll see that this kit is branded from the company iHeart Kit. This is a company that I never heard of before and was something that was a bit of a surprise when I opened up the box. The model, when you look at for these kits on the internet, are generally found under a different branding and that branding name is called Merit. Most people might not recognize the name Merit, however, if you were into collecting 1-6 scale action figures in the earlier mid-2000s time frame, the name Merit should sound familiar because back during that era, Merit was an importer and distributor for various 1-6 scale weapons, accessories, and artillery pieces that were being produced in that time frame. Not only did they do this with several pieces in 1-6 scale, but there were also a few releases in 1-18 scale as well. Merit would release sporadic models throughout this time frame. I want to say I stopped hearing about them from around the 2009 to 2011 time frame. Prior to that, one of the hallmark pieces that they did release was a 1-6 scale German 37 millimeter anti-tank piece. And the unit from what I can remember people posting about on the 1-6 scale forums was that the model was very nicely detailed, unfortunately was a bit on the frail and fragile side due to the type of material that the unit was casted in. Shortly after the Merit release, I want to say about a year or two later, Dragon would come out with their own Pack 37 all injection molded plastic and the Merit one basically sailed off into the sunset. Another noteworthy release from Merit was the 118 scale German 88 millimeter. And the flak unit was also very nicely detailed, but what was interesting about that was that Merit did not have the tooling for that. The flak 37 was actually a rebox of the 21st Century Toys 118 scale model, which at this time we're talking about maybe, yeah, 2011, 2012 or so, 21st century threw in the towel and was defunct, but Merit was able to find the factory that had the molds and they were able to produce these models and sell them in their own skies. I remember when that kid dropped, a lot of the 116 scale guys didn't understand why would they go with 118 scale as opposed to 116, but the answer was because it was from their 21st century toys 118 scale lineup. And that was basically the last I heard about that company until I stumbled into this particular kit that we have here. So imagine my shock when I stumbled into a 1-6 scale plastic model of a weapon set and it was from the company Merit no less. So I went ahead did some more scrounging on the internet. This kit here, it's not really that common. It's not like something that you're gonna find in a hobby shop. If you do, you know, you got a kick-ass hobby shop, but this is something that you are gonna find from a online retailer. Also, I believe these kits are fairly new to the marketplace. On the side of the box here has a copyright date of 2019. However, since it is from the manufacturer that I'm gonna to touch upon in a second, this is something that is always a little hazy because they tend to update the release dates on the copyright as the kits are in continuous production. This kit here, I paid roughly 30 or 40 US dollars, and that's generally the sweet spot you tend to find them on the internet. Sometimes they're a little bit lower, but they make up with that with the cost of the shipping. For this particular model, I picked it up off of AliExpress. I have the link for this particular vendor listed below in the video description. But needless to say, I may or may not have ordered one or both of those artillery sets. We'll see. 
as for this one, the model was shipped, it eventually came in, and when I opened up the box, I was surprised to see what I found with both the internal contents as well as also with the external marketing. As I mentioned before, the kits are branded on all the other websites that I've seen this kit listed for Merit, where they have their logo right over here. However, with this one, it's this weird company that I personally never heard of. I believe what's going on is that just like with Tegan, where the Tegan distribution in the US is done by TaganTanks.com and the European sales are done by Toro, I believe a similar thing is happening with these kits over here. So starting with the external appearance, here we have the model with the boxer, or it's not really a boxer, it's more or less just a photograph of the build unit. Here we have the SG-43 on its notorious little wheeled wagon. The model is basically what you see is what you get from the box and it appears to be very nicely built and painted. The remainder of the graphic design is quite standard for another plastic model company I'll touch upon in a second. I keep saying that, but I, I promise it's gonna be an interesting reveal. But here you get to see the typeface over here, the scale, as well as the other relevant information. On the side of the box, we have a little thumbnail of the model from its side view. This is not a painting or anything. This is just a side photograph of the model in question. Some more typography with the information as well as the logo. This is kit number 60602, if that means anything. On this side over here, we have a brief history of the SG-43, as well as some other screenshots, or I should say sample photographs, of the built unit in question. And the modeler did actually a very good job building it. On the reverse end, we have some more angles of the unit, only this time it's an illustration, as well as some corporate info. And this is where things should look very familiar to anyone who builds a lot of 135th scale kits, specifically from a certain Chinese company. If anyone is watching this and are getting a sense of deja vu with the way everything is laid out with the typeface and the graphic design, as well as also with that little 14 plus little graphic right over here, that's because this kit here is actually a trumpeter. The kit is made by trumpeter. I have tons of proof as soon as I crack the box open, you'll look at the runners and be like, yeah, John, this thing's a trumpeter. The typography is trumpeter, the, the images are trumpeter, the freaking illustration on the side is trumpeter. This is trumpeter tooling through and through, which is not a detriment. That is a plus because trumpeter tooling is excellent. Hard to say, I don't really know the internals of the company. However, I will say that Trumpeter has been known to do this in the past with other sister companies. Such come to mind would be Hobby Boss, Mini Hobby Models, as well as WSN. And that's just scratching the surface because there are several other Chinese no-name companies out there that are using Trumpeter tooling. Cracking open the box reveal the inner contents. And the first thing I do want to say is that this kit is all injection molded polystyrene. There are no extra type of fittings made in brass, metal, or photo etch. So what you see, it's an old school plastic kit through and through. Something else I want to mention is that this kit here is all made from this green polystyrene plastic, which is a bit different from the other kits released by Trumpeter. Generally, Trumpeter kits for the modern era are molded in gray plastic, while this one here, they went with an older school green coloring, which is something that you would see on Trumpeter kits from the early 2000s time frame. However, the quality of the parts and the quality of the plastic are still top notch. Just like with most model kits, all the parts are sealed in these hermetically sealed bags and this does do a pretty good job in keeping everything nice and organized until I open them up in order to do a review, then I'm totally lost. But anyway, as for the parts over here, these are probably the largest components on the set, which consists of the main spine for the wheeled wagon. This is a two half assembly, which means there is going to be a slight seam to contend with, but you know, that's quite customary on these builds. On the details themselves, they are pretty nicely detailed. We have here a weld bead running from top to bottom and is nicely sculpted into the plastic molding. On the top portion over here, we have an embossed stamp line, which on the real unit would be a rigidity stamping. The little handles are nicely rendered and the whole piece appears to be nicely scaled. In the same bag here, we have a Russian 762 caliber ammo can. And I can tell you for a fact that they did an excellent job with the geometry as well as the detailing on this piece, which I'll touch upon later in this video. But needless to say, 
Good job, whoever did the CAD work for this piece over here. The piece is a single molding, which means there's no seams to worry about, but it's also nice and hollow to, of course, mount or insert in a ammo belt of one flavor or another. The next runner is one that is awesome and it sucks at the same time because it gives you an excellent option. Unfortunately, it also gives you temptation to buy more of these kits, which, uh, spoiler alert, is something that I've actually done, but more information on that is to follow. What this runner is, it gives you the parts for the barrel assembly. So we have here the standard SG-43 and we have the SGM counterpart. The difference is that on the standard infantry version, it's just a smooth tapered surface, while on the other version, we have these really cool flutes that are milled in. On the ends, we have two flash suppressors and they are nice and hollow, which is an excellent, excellent bit of detailing. And it's one that saves the builder a lot of time trying to have to drill out. The pieces are a two part assembly where the back portion is over here where we have the gas block. However, this is something that is very easily addressed with just some basic seam removal skills. The SGM version is probably a little bit more difficult to do the seam removal on due to the little fins that are present on the surface as if you use putty or if you use a type of super glue, you want to be careful with the application because it could easily clog up these fins over here which will kind of throw off the look of the piece. But regardless, it's still fairly easily done. One other thing I want to mention is with the runner itself, this is very, very trumpeter tooling. If anyone's ever built a trumpeter kit and actually pay attention and looked at the runners, you'll see a striking resemblance to this one over here. On a similar note, even with the way these bags are hermetically sealed, it's very, very trumpeter-ish with the way they use this grid type clamp to melt the bags together. As for the internal runner itself, here we have several of the components to assemble the receiver of the SG-43 as well as the remainder of the wagon. Here we have the main side of the SG-43 receiver, or well, it would be like that <laughs> when it's finally built. Here we have the receiver itself with the lightning cut right there on the back, which is a very distinctive feature found on the SG-43 rear receiver. We also have the gas system, and there's your gas piston right over there where the gas block is connected to it. Once the barrel assembly goes on, it probably all fills in this area, but that is something that did catch my eye. We have other components for the cradle, which would be this mechanism here. The biggest, of course, is the armored shield right here. And it does have that little bend in it, which is used for, oops, get that on camera, which is used for when this is, is this mount is actually position for anti-aircraft use, but I'll touch upon more of that as the video goes on. We got here a carry handle, as well as also the ammunition can holder right over here. Very nicely made, and the piece is, you know, it's whoever did this really did their homework. This here is a shell deflector, and again, nicely done. Probably one of the weakest aspects of this kit, however, is the ammo belt. If there was one thing to criticize, it would definitely be that. The ammo belt, you'll notice that they modeled it in the same material as the remainder of the piece. And this was probably done to save on costs as well as, you know, it cuts down on the parts because it just, you know, build it integrally to this runner. However, this is something that is always problematic. A bullet belt needs to be a very flexible type system and when you shoehorn it with the standard plastic it never really works out all that well. Dragon actually did this on their M2HB model and it's definitely the weakest aspect of that kit as well for the same reasons. The quality of the actual ammo belt itself is not bad. On the real SG-43 it utilizes a Maxim pattern of belt and from what I see here it seems to do the job pretty well. So the last bag contains the last runner in this set, and this obviously finishes off what the other two runners didn't. So here we have the main wheels for the wagon. There are four because these are a two-piece assembly. The wheels themselves are pretty good for what they are. You know, they do a good job mirroring the real one. The remainder of the pieces on the runner are for both the carriage, the cradle, and also the remainder of the SG-43. Here we have the other side of the receiver with the lightning cut that I mentioned before, and there goes your ejection port. Well, I'll touch upon that more as the video goes on. Here we have the spade grips, as well as also the charging handle, which is cool because it's mounted on the bottom, similar to a DSHK. Hopefully it comes out in focus, but molded in 
are all of the little relevant details which would be found on the real unit. And this is something that is generally overlooked on almost all of the other 1-6 scale weapon sets that are out there. The lettering is nicely visible and I'm pretty sure this is going to come out really well once I do all the weathering and the dry brushing. However, there is a slight asterisk and that is although the quality of detailing is excellent on this top cover and the fact that they went ahead and included it really shows that they're pretty serious about the detailing on this set. There is one problem with this information and hopefully this comes out on camera but if you're looking for a World War II SG-43, yeah, this isn't going to be it. And the reason why I say that is that the SG-43 is, of course, a World War II designed MG and was used extensively by the Soviets during the war. However, it was also picked up post-World War II and produced in several of the other satellite Warsaw Pact countries. Czechoslovakia is one of them, surprisingly, because the Czechs basically went off on their own with everything else, but they actually produced their own version of the SG-43, and that's what we have right here. The reason why I say this is because of, well, the information that's right here on top of the feet tray cover. You'll notice that it is written in Czech, and it's not written in Cyrillic, but most importantly, if you look at the manufacturing date, you will see the date of 1953 which was when the Czechs started production of their copy of the SG-43. And you can see the factory that they produced it in, which is also TGF, which is true. All that information is fantastic. However, if you're trying to add this piece to your 1-6 scale Russian layout, or if you really, you know, want to be true to form on your equipment and you want everything to be period correct, uh, this is going to be a bit of a curveball because obviously this is a post-war production unit. And I'm pretty sure 90% of people out there aren't going to care. They're just going to build this piece, keep it in their World War II Russian collection, and call it an A. And by the way, that's fine, me included. I'm also into that camp. Uh, but it is one of those fine little minutia bits of detailing that I did want to mention. Uh, this is also more common than you may think. Uh, in a lot of the older video games, like the older Call of Duty games I used to play back in the day, uh, you would be on a Browning M1919 A4 and on the top cover you would have Hebrew markings on it because the unit that they were referencing was one of the Israeli versions of the M1919 but that's a whole nother story. But anyway, it is a nice little bit of detailing and I'm glad that they actually molded in. It's really, really cool. The inner portion of the of the feed cover is right over here. Not really sure how it's going to pan out once everything is built but we'll see how that works. And again, I'm actually really excited to getting this one started. So that's it for the components. There are no water slide decals or markings whatsoever. It's, you know, it's just a weapon set, so that's all there is to that. Here we have the instructions. One thing that's really interesting is that they went ahead and blacked out this portion here of the instruction printing because this is probably where the Merit logo originally stood. In fact, if I could peel this off... I can! Look at that, you see? There we have the Merit logo popping through. Can't believe I got that off without ripping it, but ta-da! There you can see that is the original Merit logo. And as I stated before, these kits were, I guess, imported originally from Merit. Now, I don't know if that's the case. It's kind of murky. I, I'm, my details on that aspect are a bit murky, but it is something that I did want to touch upon. Let's put that back over there. Okay, so uh, the instructions, very trumpeter. I mean... If, if this had a Trumpeter logo on it, I would not be surprised at all. Neither would anyone else who has built any of their kits. But needless to say, this is going to go together pretty well because from the Trumpeter kits I've built in the past, I never really had any problems with parts being mismatched or anything. One really cool aspect of the SG-43 platform is that with this wagon, it's a dual purpose type system where it can be used as a ground mount with, you know, the wagon wheels. But you can also go ahead and use it for anti-aircraft. And this kit here does have that, which it also sucks, which means, you know, <laughs> I think I'm going to be buying more of these kits as time goes on. But this is, again, something I am going to touch upon briefly once everything is built and completed. So, you know, it is a really nicely detailed model and everything is where it needs to be. So from the instructions takes us to this little illustration here. And guys, do I really need to point out how much trumpeter this is? I mean, it's it, it, it's literally trumpeter. Same illustration, same color, same 
gradients, everything. So either they have someone who's really good at copying Trumpeter or it's just Trumpeter making these kits. But needless to say, this is actually a nice little color chart. It tells you what parts are components on the SG-43 itself as opposed to what parts are on the wagon which are painted differently. So nicely appreciated. The final thing on the bottom of the box here is just a sample of more Trumpeter kits like the Atomic Annie, which is something I didn't know they made. Huh. Well, that's probably something to look into. Regardless, you can see here just some of the other kits that are from iHeartKit, which, uh, yeah, sure you are. But, ooh, here I was touching upon before. We have some 116 scale artillery pieces. These are really cool. And there's that, one, there's that 118 scale FLAC 88 that I was talking about earlier. And here we have the model fully assembled, and at this point it's ready for painting. Just before I go ahead and get it off into paint, I might as well just talk about some of the features that are present on the unit at this time. The first thing I want to touch upon is how quickly this unit goes together. This is a very simple kit, so the assembly time slides by pretty quickly. The only thing that slows down the assembly time is waiting for some of the adhesives to dry, as well as polishing away several of the multiple seams that are present on several of the components. The model's fit was really, really good. The pieces went together without any sort of problems, which is, again, what we would associate with a modern era kit from Trumpeter. One thing that I do want to point out about the assembly was that, unlike several of the Dragon 1-6 scale kits that are out there, where, depending on the kit in question, the instructions are worse than others, this one here, that wasn't the case. The instructions were clear, concise, no vagueness whatsoever, and because of that, this really accelerates the build and also makes it go together much more easily. Almost the entire unit is built out of the box at this point, with the exception of one or two little tweaks that I made to it that I'm going to touch upon in a moment. As I said, the unit is ready for painting and all the pieces are not permanently attached at this point. The unit comes apart in about three or four sub-assemblies, which is the best way to go about with this build, just so it ensures that you thoroughly paint all the components properly and it avoids any sort of mistakes. Starting with the ammo can, the ammo can has two hinge sections, which is as per the real unit. The one thing that I did notice about the ammo can that was a bit funky was with the hinge mechanism itself. You see, just like with the Dragon 1-6 scale kits with a similar type of system, the hinge is fully functional and they have a separate molded pin. The pin on the supplied kit is a thin little piece of plastic and again, this same type of feature is found on some of the Dragon kits. If you are working on any of these models and they have that type of setup, Best thing to do is just avoid the plastic pin whatsoever. Just throw in the spare parts bin or into the or into the junk pile. The pins are molded very very fine, and they have a nub sticking out of them that you have to snip off. Which cleaning the piece off properly, in order for it to fit inside of the small little recess here found in the hinge, is very very tricky, if not almost impossible. Also, the pieces are very frail, so even during installation, if there's any sort of hang-up whatsoever, or if there's any sort of flex on the piece itself, the hinge is going to go, and it's going to cause some other problems. On my builds, the first thing that I do is I replace the plastic pin with a metal steel pin. The pin itself is made from a sewing pin, so obviously these are really easy to come by and really cheap, and the piece is much stronger compared to the plastic counterpart. The only thing you gotta do is just replace the piece. No drilling or other sorts of mods need to be made to the ammo can in order to get the piece to fit in place. Once they are fit in place, you can see that the articulation is very, very good. Another thing I want to mention about the ammo can is with the locking tab. On the real unit, this piece here would hinge downward and then you would rotate this little tab and it'll keep the unit in place and prevent it from opening up. The problem is that if you mount it in the open position, when you mount it inside of the little ammo can holder, the uh, tab is going to make contact with the frame and it's actually going to hang it up and prevent it from seating fully. I noticed on this build here it was best to mount it in the horizontal position just so that the piece clears the ammo can holder up properly and it fits on in a nice square manner. However, if you do this, keep in mind you're not going to be able to lock the unit in place. So this is one of those features where if you want to have the ammo can close, just model it in the closed position. And if you want to have it open and functional like this here, just forego the pin altogether. Another option is to possibly modify this piece to make it functional, but that requires a little bit more work that's outside the scope of this video. 
The only thing to mention on the ammo can is with the inside portion of the lid here, there are several knockout marks, and these were polished away with some sandpaper and with an X-Acto knife, leaving for the smooth position that we have here. Obviously, this is important to point out because if you have the unit mounted in place like this with the piece in the open manner for display, those knockout marks really can't hurt the look, so it's it would behoove you to go ahead and polish those down. There are some other knockout marks on the inside of the can, but they're so deep in that they're not going to be a problem, specifically if you have an ammo belt inside. Obviously, it's going to cover that up. From the ammo can, takes us to the SG-43 itself. The piece just locks in onto the cradle via these two pegs that we have here, and it just seats in fully without any sort of mods or hand fitting needs to be made to the... the holes or even to the pegs themselves. Like I said before, the piece is very nicely engineered in that regard. For this unit here, I went with the SG-43, the one with the smooth barrel. So the one with the fins are probably going to be put into the spare parts bin, or more likely I'm going to be recycling it on another build. And more information on that is to follow. But as for the main SG-43 itself, like I touched upon before, it goes together really easily and it does have some functionality to it. The little carry handle here for the barrel is fully functional where you can see it can rotate fully. The feed tray cover does open up. It's a bit sticky, but it does open up nonetheless. The detailing on the in inner portion here is a bit on the basic end. I believe there's a bit more stuff going on on the inside here of the feed tray with the way the feed paws work, but from here it seems like it'll do the job just fine. It does clip into place very nicely, and I will say that the hinge mechanism is pretty chunky on it, which is a good thing because this means it's going to be very robust. The sight is also fully functional, but one thing that I do want to mention is that when you're assembling the receiver sections, you need to have the sight and the feed tray cover in place as the receiver halves get glued together. This is how the unit is sandwiched in line and once the receiver sections dry the pieces are going to be fully functional because of this you want to be careful on the locations and the amount of glue that you use because obviously if you add too much it's going to gum up the works and your pieces are no longer going to be functional on the receiver and on the barrel sections themselves there are several seams that you are going to have to contend with and most of the seam work is easily tackled namely on the bottom portion over here as well as on the straight sections of the main barrel these were polished away with a needle file with some fine sandpaper, you know, quite customary seam removal that you'll see on basically every type of model tank kit out there. The front sight base has also a little bit of seam to contend with where the pieces mount in place, and there's also a small seam on the top portion and the bottom portion here of the gas block. The trickiest areas that you are going to need to worry about the seam removal is right here on the front trunnion section of the receiver specifically on this little portion right here in front of the feed tray cover. Note that there is this little cut found in this area over here, and this is something that can be a bit difficult for some people to get in there to polish away that seam. On this model here, the way I took care of it was I actually put the unit via these two mounting lugs here on my mill vise, and I was able to put a small bit on my mill and actually milled out the area over here leaving for the recess as well as also for the piece being nice and smooth. This was probably the easiest way to tackle this part but obviously if you don't have a mill lying around in your shop it's going to be a little bit more tricky. It's not impossible it could still be done but the mill did make the job easier by tenfold and also with the way the real SG-43 is made this piece is milled in much the exact same manner so no changes detail wise were made to this part here and basically the mill bit followed the molded in tombstone shape over here cut absolutely perfectly. The next tricky piece to polish away was this portion here underneath the rear sight. What makes this tricky is that you have the two rear sight protector wings on either side which inhibit the sandpaper or needle file from getting in here trying to polish it down and then you have the frail, the mostly or I should say the relatively frail functional rear sight over here flopping around and this can possibly break if you accidentally hit it during the sanding process. So you want to have some care in this area over here. The remainder of the SG is pretty straightforward. The charging handle just clips directly in place as does the main grips. The trigger mechanism goes together extremely easily. It's only two or three pieces and 
you just follow the instructions and the piece should fall into place. The one thing that I do want to mention about the instructions though is that when they're assembling this in the instructions they show the piece mounted upside down and that's because when the unit is being assembled you're doing it in the upside down manner. But keep this in mind because you could accidentally install this right side up which may be a problem. So that's really the only hazard I want to mention on the instructions. And that's basically it for the SG. So now let's go to the cradle itself. The cradle will be mounted onto this portion here of the tripod with a pin. The pin is still housed on the runner because that's going to be painted on the sprue, clipped off for final installation. The piece here goes together like a breeze. There's really no hand fitting that needs to be done. The only thing that you do have to touch upon though is with the seam removal. The main square tubing section over here is a two-piece assembly so again seam removal is going to need to be done before all these components here get fitted in place but outside of that once the seam removal is taken care of the piece does fly by on a similar note with the instructions you want to be or have some care on some of these components over here again due to the orientation just to make sure that you mount them in the correct way the Spen shell ejection chute over here goes together really easily just a couple drops of glue and the piece is good to go yeah basically there's nothing really much to talk about in this it's just a really easily assembled kit and this brings us to the well actually the shield area the shield just slides into place like it does on the real unit the only difference is on this one here you want to add a little drop of glue on the shield rails because on the real unit you would actually tighten it in place via this little clamp right over here on the model one obviously that's not the, not the way it works so a drop of glue is going to be necessary you can as build this unit with the shield absent if you so desire but generally when you see these things they usually have the shield in place the yoke itself just pops right into this location here and the friction fit is really really good and you're not going to have to worry about the thing falling apart on you the shield one thing that i like about it is the thinness on the shield itself, the one thing that I really like on how the kit was designed was with the thickness of the plastic. It is nice and thin to scale through and through. On some other kits out there, not necessarily in one six scale, but on several smaller kits in order to get this type of appearance, they do that thing where it's molded thicker towards the center and then it tapers off on the edge portion so that you have the best of both worlds. The piece is nice and, th it's nice and durable, but you do have some scale thickness edging around the perimeter on this model here they didn't do that and the piece is nice and accurate because of that so this brings us to the cradle the or not the cradle that's the cradle this here is the main carriage as you can see the wheels are not permanently attached at this point this obviously is going to be fitted to the axle section once everything is painted and weathered the piece is a two-part assembly so you are going to have a center seam right along these two areas here to contend with and this was easily done with some sandpaper because of the geometry of the piece you do have these rigidity stamps found on either side you know how they or they press inward and this does make the addition of some super glue and sanding actually a bit easier because of this shape the sandpaper if you bend it a certain way will just go into this groove and it'll just polish the thing through and through there are some other seams because since the entire piece is literally just cut right in half down the middle, you are going to deal with some seams on the front fork section as well as on the axle. Again, these are easily polished away with some sandpaper as well as a needle file for the finer, harder to reach locations. One mod that I made to the wagon itself involves these two locations that we have here and here. Note, I went ahead and added two little fasteners on either side on these two locations. On the real unit, these can actually hinge upward, and because of that, there is a rivet fastener that's used to keep them in place. Well, the rivet detailing is present on the model's tooling. However, because of the way the mold sections are split, you do have this small little mold seam running along these two locations. And because of that, when you're trying to polish it down, the little dome head rivet's not really that pronounced and it's easily flushed away. So much so that I recommend just polishing it off altogether. On the model here, I took a Dremel with a small Dremel bit, drilled out the center portions of these two locations, and then I was able to replace the lost detailing with a small sewing pin. I just snip the pin to place, install it to these two areas, and the detailing has been returned. On the rear portion over here, the same thing was done for the same reason, and I do want to touch upon one thing on the real unit. You can actually 
separate these two pieces where if you hit this tab, the unit actually hinges downward and tucks away, making for the wagon here to be a little bit easier transported. But on the model here, that's not the case. That feature is not found and the unit is in the deployed state out of the box. You can theoretically modify this in order to have that function, but again, that's a bit out of scope for this video. Last but not least, takes us to the wagon wheels. Nothing much to talk about here. They just get glued together as per the kit and they just polish down the seam, which, be, which would be present right here on the center tire. And that's basically it. So from here, all of these pieces are going to head off into paint. The first thing I'm gonna do is prime everything and then I could continue with the remainder of the paint work. And here's the model now fully completed. Let me go ahead and bring the camera in closer so you get a better idea on some of the features that the model does have. So starting with the wheels, as I touched upon before, they are a two-piece assembly and here's what they look like fully completed. The seam work was addressed earlier on in the video. The only thing to mention about the wheels is what they are painted. On the real unit, I believe they are made out of wood that have metal reinforcement sections on the spokes, and then there's a metal band that gives you the tire. The tire detailing was just simply just painted on. I used Vallejo silver paint for the paintwork, and once it's applied via paintbrush, it gives you the look that we have here. Of course, the wheels are fully functional, and they're held in place with that small little pin that is present on the injection molded parts. And then, of course, once everything was painted and weathered in time for installation, it was snipped off the sprue and secured in place. Of course, these are pieces you want to paint on the sprue because they can get lost extremely easily. And that's also the case with a few other pins that are found on this model. Moving to the rear section of the cart, as I touched upon before, there was a bit of seam removal work done in this area over here. And once completed, you can see that it leaves for a nice seamless appearance, which again gives it a more accurate look. On top of that, you can also see what those fastener details look like once they are added and painted in place. The next thing I want to talk about is the ammo can. And no, the one on the table is obviously not the 1.6 scale one. It's my real SG-43 ammo can. And the reason why I have this on the table is to point out, one, the color that this thing is found in, but also, more importantly, there's a bit of detailing that's missing on the iHeart kit slash trumpeter one that I do want to mention. And that would be on the top part that we have here. On the ammo can, there is obviously some kind of a handle mechanism in order to lug this thing around because once it's fully loaded, it gets pretty heavy pretty quick. Well, as we can recall on the kit one, for some reason, they went ahead and omitted the latch, or I should say the handle detailing found here on the top. It's funny, they did the small little intricate information found on the top V cover, but they left out the handle. Regardless, Fortunately, the handle on these cans are really easily fabricated. On the real one here, to take example, the handle itself is nothing more than a little bit of webbing material. And then it's held in place with these two crimped steel sections that are just bent and riveted in place, giving it for a nice secure hold. Of course, the entire unit is held onto the can itself via these other two steel straps that are spot welded in place. Now let's bounce back to the 1.6 scale one so I can show you the scratch build detailing that I added to it. First I just want to point out the color. On this model over here I went ahead and used a different shade of Russian olive drab for the can itself. This is an easy way to give an extra bit of character and spice to a model other than painting everything with the same coloring which you can obviously do but it will be a little bit myopic. With the can itself just painted in a separate color, you can see how much more life it brings to the piece overall. Now back to the lid section, here you get to see the detailing that was scratch built by myself. All of the pieces here are scratch built out of thin scrap pieces of soda can aluminum that were carefully just trimmed to these strip type shapes and then bent and added to the locations you see here. The two clamps, or I should say the two mounts are just again bent from pieces of metal, glued to these areas. The strap itself and the end clips are made out of one piece of aluminum. I left an extra long piece and then I just bent over these sections here on either end three, two or three times, which gives you the look of that, cl that clip that I touched upon before. In order to paint everything, obviously the metal sections are painted with the same, or painted with the can itself. And then the strap here I just painted with a 
a Dunkel Gelb, actually it is to me a Dunkel Gelb, in order to give it that color like we saw on the real one. Of course, some weathering was added because these pieces are, as we saw, canvas, as opposed to something being made out of metal. Once the details are added, you can really see just how much more life it gives the can overall. With the can out of the way, the next thing to mention is the belt. This is the same kit supply belt that I touched upon before, and obviously I utilize it for this model. By the way, the can and the belt are not glued on at this time and are technically removable. However, trying to remove everything, it's a little bit easier said than done. So if you're building one of these models, you basically want to leave it in the one configuration and leave it at that. As for the belt itself, like I touched upon before, being made out of standard plastic is a bit uh, less desirable compared if the piece was made out of something flexible. However, the belt is far from being crap. As you can see, the belt, one, paints beautifully. You can really get some nice, accurate realism out of these pieces over here with, where they're, with the way they're molded, and the paintwork just really follows suit with that. But because of the thinness of the belt itself, you can have some flexibility with adjusting the belt much along the way you see it on this model over here. What you see here is just me just bending the piece until it bends to a certain position and I leave it at that. You do have some limits with this. If you bend it too much, it will snap. If that happens, you know, it's definitely something less than ideal. You can possibly try to hit it with a hairdryer or a heat gun to try to contort it, make it soft and bend it further or use the uh, warm water trick that may work too however i really want to strongly suggest not using either of those techniques both of those are pretty risky and you have a really good chance on just screwing it up as opposed to getting the bend that you want i just saw on this bill here just bend it by hand and you do get some limited flexibility and adjustment to it which by in all means looks the part quite well as for painting, this is where the set, again, comes into its own. Because of how nicely rendered the belt is, it just lends itself for some nice, accurate-looking paintwork. Of course, the SG-43 utilized the same the non disintegrating belt from the Maxim, and the Maxim belt has the one portion completely covered up, but on the other portion, you can still see the brass casings on the ammo. Well, when you're painting this, you want to paint the entire belt itself with just some flat black spray paint. Then with a very fine paintbrush with some gold or brass paint, you go ahead, paint the the casings themselves, and then with another, or with the same paintbrush all washed out with some copper paint, you can go ahead and paint the projectiles. If you get a little paint in between these sections over here, that's okay with a small swipe of flat black, you can touch up these areas over here, which will improve the piece and give it a nice, accurate look. One other thing to mention is that with Comblock belts like this, you have a couple different options to render them. Of course, the the Comblock countries are known for having steel case ammo, and you can have them either in a gray color or even in an all copper color, because they did have copper wash ammo. For this one here, I went with just standard brass case just like this real McCoy 762x54R round that you can see on the table. So, and this by the way is a 1989 production, so they were still producing brass ammo for quite a while, but there was also a lot of steel case ammo produced in the Comblock countries for a long period of time and even still today. But anyway, because of all these factors, this does open up some other alternatives and possibilities for you to render the unit that we have here. Also, now that the model is fully painted, you can really see how the pivoting feature works. And it actually works very nicely. You have a good arc, just like the real unit. And with this one here, the tolerances are so tight that it really does a good job with holding it in place and it doesn't wobble around loose on you. I presume that after prolonged use, this will eventually wear out. But as you can see for this one over here, it's very nice and tight. The same is also true for the elevation. where you can have quite a bit of an arc in that regard as well. Also, just like with the pivoting, it's a bit stiff once fully painted and the unit can't possibly break in, but you do want to have some care with that because after prolonged use, it will still get a little loose. And also on top of that, one other thing to watch out for if you're messing around with the elevation is because with the shape everything is, you can potentially break something if you put pressure in the wrong spot. So you want to take your time and be careful when you're messing around with the elevation on the unit. One other thing I am going to mention before I get on to paint is the set does 
allow you to have the unit either in the ground roll or in the anti-aircraft roll, just like the real counterpart. And some people might be watching this and saying, oh, that's really cool. I get one of these and I can display it in, you know, any configuration I want on the fly. And that's something that's not really possible. Although technically, yeah, you can do that. In practice, this actually just lends to problems. By having the piece not glued in place or having it a removable, you are going to mess around, fiddle with it, and you're, the only thing you're going to do is cause breakage to many of the components. Also, for it to be mounted in the other roll, you do have to make some slight modifications to the model because the way the kit is designed, it is designed to be built in the configuration that we have here. If you're going to mount it with the AA mount, you do have to make some mods to both the mounts and also on the cradle mounts in order to adapt it for that to make it look more realistic. But the real reason why it's not a good idea to have a switchable thing is, again, due to the propensity of the thing to break. And this is actually something that I touched upon with the Dragon Well Bike video. In that kit, that kit does allow you to build the well bike either in the collapsed storage mode where, you know, it looks like they dropped it off the plane or in the deployed state. And like I stated in that video, yes, theoretically you can have the model convert, but realistically it's not, it's not really worth it and it just lends itself to breaking. So if anyone, just like with that model, with this one here, if you're interested in the ground mount and the RNT air mount, I recommend getting two of them and building one dedicated for each and building them and paint them identical and you'll have your cake and eat it too, which is, spoiler alert, something that I did, but <laughs> that's the topic for another video. So back to this one with the paintwork, there are lots of options out there on how these wagons are painted. I've seen examples where the section here is all green along with the mounts and I've seen versions where everything is black and I've seen like this version here where the cradle itself is green but the mounts are black so this does open up quite a bit of different configurations you could paint this thing and which is you know a nice little touch and that's really best up to the builder's discretion. For the SG-43 itself again it paints very very nicely and once the seams are removed it just looks really really nice. Some things to mention are with the color. On the SG-43, and this is also true for many of the other Russian World War II arms, the outward color wasn't parkerized per se like they were on American weapons. Instead, it was more like what the other European countries were doing, where the coloring was more of a blued finish. And for this one here, I went ahead and spray painted it all with just standard El Cheapo flat black. And then I weathered it with dry brushing and some airbrushing here and there to get the look that we have here. If anyone is interested, I have a video tutorial on how I weather my models like this. And that can be found in the video description listed below. And it's also, of course, on the channel. The only difference is the base color. That one was an M1919A4 and because that had a parkerized coloring to it, while this one here being with that blue finish, the main base coat was a different paint, but the remainder of the techniques are still the same. Also, like I touched upon before, with the weathering, you really get to appreciate those marks that are found right there on the top V cover. Even though they are a bit anachronistic for a World War II Soviet piece, it's still cool nonetheless, and I still really appreciate that. On the other bits of detailing to mention specifically for weathering is right here on the gas port. The SG-43 is just like many of the Degtrev designs where we have an external piston and here's the gas uh, port right here. And because of that, the piston is left in its natural chrome coloring. This is one thing that the Russians love to do on their small arms because it's easier to clean. And in order to replicate this, the piston section here was painted in silver paint. Then with the airbrush with some Tamiya flat black, I add the little poof right over here, which gives it that nice carbon fouling look, which of course would be really prevalent on the real unit, specifically after it burned through a few rounds. A similar weathering technique was also done right here on the flash suppressor, where it's hopefully it pops out on camera, but you could see the faint powder fouling found on the muzzle end. And it's again another way to give a little bit more accuracy and realism to the model. On a similar note, something else that's noteworthy is the shell ejection port, which sadly is mostly obscured by the spent shell shoot over here but the the port itself is really cool because of its really unique shape to it and also its color on the real units the 
section on the inside is silver and the reason why it's silver is that's actually part of the bolt carrier group and when it's closed it seals it off and you have that bare chrome metal type surface exposed. Well I painted with the same color that I use here for the piston and that was carefully applied with a paintbrush. Then with the airbrush I add a little bit of black sud effects to it for reasons that should be fairly obvious. While on the paintwork, I might as well mention the grips. The grips here on this model representing red Bakelite, which again is a common technique that I do on my builds. And it's also a common material found on the real SG-43. Just like with other weapons of the period, the grips were in a multitude of different materials from wood to different colors of Bakelite. And this is really best up to the builder's discretion. Me personally, I like to roll with Bakelite because I like the way it looks. And also for a painting standpoint, it's much easier to done to replicate Bakelite than it is to try to replicate wood. The color is just to me a whole red with some gloss lacquer. And then I went ahead and gave it a little bit of an extra dry brushing technique in order to give it the worn look that you see here. On the front carry handle, one thing to mention is that the carry handle is composed of three pieces on the real unit. We have the metal clamp itself and then there are two small side panels that get fastened in place. Well on the model here if you're painting this you want to be careful not to paint the entire unit with whatever color that you're going with. On this one here the, only the panels are painted with the hull red while this leaves a nice little metal colored spine on the inside portion over here, which again, best emulates the real unit. And it's a way to give you some nice bit of extra detailing without needing to do all that much more extra work. The last painting detail to mention on the SG-43 is with the receiver rack number that we have here. Of course, one easy way to add so much extra character, uniqueness and detailing to your MG models is to add a rack number on one section or another. This is something that is not uncommonly seen in the field with military weapons and when added to the model here it just spices it up that much more. The application is done with a very small paintbrush and some flat white paint. And that's it for the SG and the ammo can so this brings us now to the actual wagon itself. The wagon is painted with a base coat of Tamiya olive green and then several washes and filters were added to it bringing it to the look that we have here. Also, like on my builds, I give a little bit of chipping and other worn effects with the dry brushing, and it just makes the model look complete overall. Even though the model has absolutely no worse like decals on it whatsoever, I still went ahead and thoroughly coated the entire unit with VMS matte varnish. After the varnish is added, it always seems to amplify the colors on the existing piece, and it just makes it look all that much more polished. At the end of the day, I couldn't be any happier in how this build turned out. This was a somewhat impromptu project in that I wasn't, you know, seeking this model or had it planned or anything. It just kind of sort of fell in my lap, as a lot of projects seem to do these days. But regardless, the quality of the model itself is excellent. The kit is very nicely engineered. The parts go together very well and pretty much easily. And without a whole lot of time, you can have yourself a very nice example of an SG-43 Gorgonov. The kit's subject matter is very interesting and unique, and the execution of which, like I mentioned before, is quite excellent. These models here are relatively easily tracked down and, when found, are fairly affordable. However, despite all of these positive attributes, for one reason or another, they remain to be virtually unheard of or unknown on the various online modeling and action figure websites, news groups, and social media pages that I commonly frequent. In fact, like I mentioned before, I myself had no idea this thing even existed and only ran across it on a chance encounter while surfing the net, oddly enough, looking for something else. And I'm fairly certain that a number of my viewers right now watching this are probably discovering this thing for the first time as much along the lines as I did during that exact same Google search. And I think it's safe to say we crossed over into the threshold of skill level and recommendation. This model here is a very simple and straightforward build and theoretically, yes, a beginner can put one of these together. Although I will stress that this model does require quite a bit of bodywork due to all of the two part assemblies that I touched upon before. But if you're just looking at a build in terms of just ease of assembly, yeah, a beginner can theoretically tackle one of these models. Obviously, anyone outside of that range from an intermediate to an advanced range can easily tackle one of these builds. And like I mentioned before, the only real technique that a builder needs to have in order to get one of these together is just basic seam removal work, which again, is something that needs to be done on some 
various key locations. Once those areas are all polished away, the model is basically a breeze. And if anything, it's just an exercise in paintwork at that point. One thing that I personally also like about this kit is the adaptability. Because of the relative low cost, you can get a number of these kits here and build them in a multitude of configurations. From this variant here, which is the standard version, you can have with or without the armored shield. You could have the one with the fluted barrel with or without the shield. And you could also do both renditions of the anti-air mount. And because the kits are fairly affordable, this is something that is not necessarily too hard to achieve. And this is why this kit here is a complete no-brainer for anyone who is an avid fan or a collector of 1-6 scale military action figures. If you're the type of person that has an entire bookshelf filled to the brim of figures with all of their weapons and accessories and all that good stuff, this model here I cannot recommend enough. In fact, do not walk, run to the nearest vendor where you can acquire a couple of these models. And like I just mentioned, if I were you, I wouldn't pick up one, but i pick up a number of them due to the configurations that are available on this model over here. It will definitely be something you will appreciate in your collection, hands down. Outside of the action figure collector, if anyone is an avid fan of weapons or just miniature weapon models, this kit here is also highly recommended. Because it's one six scale, it does have a nice impressive size to it, and the model is just so well executed with the way it's engineered and also with the other configurations that it comes in that this again will really lend itself to be a nice showpiece in your collection. One other person who I'd recommend this kit to would be anyone who's curious or is interested in getting into the 1-6 scale hobby. This is a question that I get asked quite frequently due to all the 1-6 scale models that I build. I commonly get encountered by people who are avid 135th scale or 116th scale builders and they want something bigger and they see the 16 scale stuff and they have you know some curiosity about it. Well 1-6 scale is great but it does have some limiting factors. First is size of the vehicles and the second is overall cost. Those models are very expensive just due to the overall size. Well just like what I mentioned in the Dragon 1-6 scale weapon and smaller vehicles videos, this set here is a nice way to get that toe dipped into the 1-6 scale pool without a whole lot of investment or problems that are associated with those other models. For instance, the model is 1-6 scale, so you get to appreciate the size of it. However, it's not nearly as big as something like a Jeep or a tank for that matter. And the costs on this thing are also very, very affordable. Being about 40 something US dollars, it costs less than some super 135th scale tank kits on the market, so obtaining one is definitely not something that's going to break the bank. So if you are out there and you're interested in 1-6 scale and you want to try your hand at something, this kit here is a something, again, that I can't recommend enough. Also, as an addendum to what I just mentioned, because this model here is just a traditional plastic model kit, there's no fancy surprises or any other type of things to worry about. It's not like it's made out of cast resin or anything along those lines. It's just a simple, bare bones, no frills, injection molded plastic model kit, which means the difficulty of the model is greatly reduced in comparison to those other sets that I just mentioned. And with that, that wraps up this model showcase video for this 1-6 scale Soviet SG-43 Gorgonov. If you like this video, be sure to subscribe to this channel where it's a great way to keep up to date on new posted content being 1-6 scale and smaller scale model showcase videos or other 1-6 scale project update videos that frequently get posted to this channel. Another way to keep in loop of new posted content is by liking us on Facebook. There I have more photographs of this particular build as well as the other smaller and larger scale builds that have been seen on this channel in the past. Furthermore, don't forget to swing by EastCoastArmory.com for more 1-6 and 1-16 scale builds and detail components. Thanks again. I'll be seeing you all again on the next one. Till then.